Hey knitters, it's time for our monthly knit and chat episode. So why don't you settle in with a drink and your knitting and let's have a good chat. Hey nerdy knitter, Tanya here. I hope you have your knitting and you're settling in and knitting with me as we chat about sock tips this week. I posted a few days ago over on the YouTube community tab asking for your best sock knitting tips and a few people shared their answers with me. And then I decided why not ask on Instagram as well. I have an Instagram account. I don't post very often and I should probably post more often, but I decided I'm going to go over there and post. So I did. I posted a a story and also just like a photo in the feed with a picture of one of the socks I was working on at the time which is now finished and the tutorial is all ready to go so you'll have to check that out next week we're knitting socks with two circular needles but with that I asked for your sock knitting tips over there on Instagram as well and we had some responses which I was very pleased to see I have a very small account so I wasn't sure I would get any responses at all but it was nice to see some so I took all of the comments I received here on YouTube and on Instagram sort of divided them up into a few different categories there weren't a ton but enough to have a little chat today so the first uh, section of comments is on about the fit of your socks. So our first comment is from Instagram, knit with all the yarn. She says knit rib for a snug fit. And I absolutely agree with that. Rib socks fit very well. They, I mean, if you've ever knit any ribbing, you can see that it expands and then it snaps back. Well, depending on the fiber you use. And if you're knitting socks, you're probably using some kind of fiber that has some elasticity, either wool with a blend of nylon, or if you don't like wool socks, there are acrylic yarn socks. And there's even some cotton, which I wouldn't usually recommend for socks, but they usually blend it with some nylon or something like that, that will give it some elasticity. But if you want even more elasticity than a rib sock, and you can be any kind of rib, a knit one purl one, knit two purl two, knit three purl one, any sort of combination you like, or even a decorative pattern, as long as there's sort of like an even distribution of knits and purls, and that even distribution like that, where you've got these columns of some kind of a knit stitch or decorative stitch, or another column of purl stitches, displacing them or lining them up like that gives them um, extra stretch. If you ever sit and look at your knitting as you're knitting, especially when you're going back and forth between knits and purls, you might notice that that action, when you knit two knit stitches in a row, the yarn stays in the same place. But when you have to bring the yarn to the front to purl, it can take a little extra yarn. And that's often why you see that, that um, enlarged knit before a purl is because that extra yarn is going back into that knit stitch. But that extra yarn or extra space also gives us that elasticity that we have from a rib. So you can stretch it very far because it has a lot of extra yarn in there to let you stretch it out. Then you can let it go and it will probably snap back into shape or at least maybe not original shape, but it should snap back some. And that is a great benefit in our socks. It means that it, the sock could fit a wide variety of feet, like circumference wise, because that rib will have, have the ability to stretch to fit different feet different feet and it also has the ability to hug your foot very well so like the first tutorial we did for socks was a plain stockinette sock even the heel flap and gusset everything was done in stockinette and I wear those socks and I like them and they're beautiful I love the stripy colors but because it's all in stockinette even the heel flap it's just the tiniest bit loose on me it's I always use this 72 stitches for my socks and that usually fits well but when it's all in stockinette I probably should go down a size, which is probably four stitches or so. And those four stitches, that half an inch could make a difference in the fit. But when I use that same number of stitches and knit a sock, the next tutorial I did was a knit two purl two rib. And I even did it along the heel flap along the back. Those socks are probably one of my favorite pairs because they hug my foot really well and they stay in place. And even putting that rib on the heel flap and gusset keeps that in place and nice and snug too. I actually prefer it more than I do a slip stitch pattern on the heel because the rib just hugs your the heel really nicely without being sometimes a slip stitch pattern you can work it too tightly and it can feel a bit tight along the heel and slip stitch patterns are nice when you need some sort of reinforcement but I just wear my socks around the house and I don't get them they don't wear out 
on the back of the heel, which is why you would put a slip stitch pattern there. So I skip the slip stitch pattern and I like to do some sort of a rib pattern there instead because it fits very nicely and I don't need that extra durability from the slip stitch pattern. So I guess all that to say that I really like a rib pattern on a sock and I definitely agree with this comment from Instagram. So the next one is from Rebecca. Draw around your foot and mark where the toes start. Toe length varies greatly and makes measuring socks sock length easier. And that is, yes, definitely a great tip. I have little cardboard cutouts of my foot, my husband's foot, and my daughter's feet. And oddly enough, we all have the same, we all have very, we all have wide feet. We all have the same sort of circumference for a foot, about 10 inches. So, well, my husband's foot is a lot longer than mine, but it's very, I don't know, I just have wide feet, I guess. So anyway, the cardboard cutout is a great idea. And the first place I heard that was in the, there's a tutorial, well, a pattern that you can download on Ravel, Ravelry called the Fish Lips Kiss Heel. Try to say that 10 times fast. And it has a great heel, which I really like and I've used before, but her instructions about making your cardboard cutout and where to put like different placements for like the toe. And I think even she has you mark like your ankle bone and stuff like that, because there's different places where you would like, if you're knitting toe up socks, like she tries to explain the place you should start if you're going to work a short row heel working toe up. So it's just, if you're looking for more information like or more details on the things you could include on this cardboard cutout, then that's a great little pattern. And I think, I mean, I haven't checked in a while, but it was like just a dollar for the pattern. And just for the, like the cardboard cutout tips, I think it's really worth it. And the heel is really great too. I guess that's really why people download it. But I was impressed with like the way she describes how to do your cardboard cutout and the measurements to put on there. Then we had another comment about that. Um, about plastic canvas for the cutout. And I thought that was such a fabulous tip because if you've done the cardboard cutouts, they might be getting worn out. I know mine are starting to like get weird fold lines and, and they're just getting a little worn. So I think I might have to go pick up some plastic canvas and, and do the cutouts that way. That seems like a really great way to keep them that will last a little longer. Just not quite sure how I can I can put markings on there, I guess, for the lines, but I can't really say, you know, you can't really write on plastic canvas. But anyway, I thought that was a great tip as well. And we have one more comment that I would put in this fit category. Emma says to try different heels and toes, they fit differently. And I definitely agree. You won't know until you try and you might discover that a certain heel type is the favorite one for you. Like you just love the way it fits on your foot. Could be a different one for your your partner or your children you might have to have like a vanilla sock recipe a different one for everybody in your family but you won't know until you try and i've got lots of tutorials here with different sock methods we're gonna have to tackle toe up socks next but i'm taking a little break from sock knitting before we start those but you also don't even have to knit a whole pair of socks you could just knit the heel like you could knit like half an inch of ribbing using like if you know the sock circumference that you like for your foot like the stitch count and you cast on that number of stitches knit in a rib for like half an inch then knit like an inch of stockinette and then work that heel construction from the beginning to the end do another inch of stockinette add a little bit more ribbing and bind off and it's not going to be a sock it's just going to be a heel with like some ribbing on both ends and you can just try that on and see how it fits there's no reason to knit a whole sock just to find out if you're just curious about the heel fit. And you could also, when you're done um, trying it on, rip it out and use the yarn for something else. There's no rule that says you can't reuse your yarn. I mean, unless you're knitting with something like mohair, which is very sticky and hard to pull back apart. But most sock yarns, you should be absolutely fine to pull that out and use it again for something else. So our next category is the heel flap and gusset. We had a couple tips about knitting those. The first one's from Celtic Ginger. When knitting a heel flap and gusset, do one full round of plain knitting before you start your decreases. And on this round, knit into the back of the gusset stitches that you picked up. It gives a beautiful clean first row and then after the extra round, start your decreases. So that is a great tip. So you've worked your gusset, you've picked up those stitches around the gusset and you got everything back on your needle. So instead of starting your decreases, you knit around, but when you get to those gusset stitches, knit them through the back legs. And if 
you, you knit in the standard Western method where the, the right leg sits on the front of your needle. Knitting, knitting them through the back twists the stitch so it tightens it up. And this area does have a tendency to be a little loose and sloppy because we've been slipping stitches along that gusset. And now we're picking up stitches, which can also be a little loose. So working them through the back loop or twisting them when you knit them will help tighten things up right there and make them a lot neater. So that is a great tip. I had to stop and get myself turned around. I'm working some short rows here, but I think I'm all set. It's a long short row now. But our next comment is from Instagram. Knit with all the yarn says, when picking up gusset stitches, add an extra stitch between the two needles twisted. So this is definitely a great way to close up that gap because I mean, you've been working your heel back and forth flat, and then you have to start knitting in the round again. And sometimes where those two places join, you can end up with a gap right there, which is very common. And there's lots of ways to close it up. You can do it after the fact with some scrap yarn. And like her, I always do this as well. I knit that, I add an extra stitch there and I usually knit it together with a stitch from the instep. And that is usually sufficient for closing things up. But even if it's not, you can always grab a bit of scrap yarn and close it up. There's lots of different ways to do it. Now, our next category of comments would fall under the category of like sock care. And the first comment from Rebecca, she says, holes, don't panic. They can be fixed. Use yarn tails, duplicate stitch, or sew it up. Also save a bit of yarn for repairs and practice darning. I use a light bulb to darn with. Now, I have heard people say that they use light bulbs for darning and I don't, I, I think that I'm fascinated by that. I have not tried that. I do have a little darning egg, which I've never used. I have, I had one pair of socks that wore out one of the first pairs I knit. And I think it's because they were very loose because the yarn, well, wasn't my favorite yarn. I think it was, it was Red Heart, Heart and Soul, which is really, I found it hard to wear. Like it's really hard. It felt really wiry on my foot, like just really hard on the foot. But I think I knit too loosely and that they did wear out on the heel and the big toe. And I did practice darning on them. It was quite a mess, my first darning experience. But you won't, of course, you don't know until you try it, right? So the more you do it, the easier it gets and the better you get at it. I, but I'm fascinated by this. Um, I've heard other people say this. They use a light bulb. You're not scared of like accidentally breaking it. I mean, feels light bulbs seem pretty fragile to me. I don't know, but I think that's really cool. If you do that, I'd love to hear about that. Like it just, it seems so neat, but I don't know. I have a darning egg. I'm kind of scared of trying a light bulb as my darning egg, but if you do it, that's good. I, I think it's, I think it's really cool. And then the next comment is from Juliet. Duplicate stitch for reinforcement is a lot of work, but something really easy to do is a chain stitch embroidery, embroidery with sock yarn over the areas that get worn thin. It has a knit look and adds a lot of thickness where needed. So if you don't, if you've tried darning and you don't like it, then a chain stitch, if you embroider, or if you don't give it a try, I mean, learn how to do it. Then I did embroidery a lot as a teenager and my early adulthood. I don't have any here. I seem to like make them and give them all away, like different pictures and things like that. I used to do like the edgings on pillowcases and stuff, but I hadn't thought to use embroidery for darning. I think that's, I mean, you see it now, like it's very popular to use different um, embroidery methods to like that pretty mended techniques, you know, where you have the, what is the word for it? Obvious mending. There's a, there's a term anyway, where you don't try to hide the mending, but you, you can really see it and you sort of decorate with it. But I don't know if that's something you want to do on your socks, but it's another method for fixing those holes and things that can happen. So that's a great tip. I hadn't thought to use the chain stitch, but now I really want to give that a try. Now we have a few more comments, but they sort of just fall under the general category of tips because I didn't know where to put them. This first one is from Rebe Rebecca. If stitches slip off your DPNs, use stoppers and move the stoppers as you come to the needle. I thought that was such a great tip. I just, I mean, if you've seen them, they're just usually little plastic pieces, pointy things or some sort of things you can stick on the ends of your needle. So it actually turns your double pointed needles into sort of like straight needles. You're putting something on one end, but I guess in, she's saying you could put them on both ends. So stitches aren't going anywhere for the, the needles you're not using because you've probably have three or four that are being used for the circumference of your, your project, your sock. 
So you only need one or even just the end of the one that you're knitting from and then your, your main needle that you're using to knit from. Everything else could have stoppers. I think that's such a great tip. I had not thought to do anything like that. I haven't had this problem where my stitches fall out, but if you do, that is something you can try. You can usually find those little stoppers. Goodness, even at big box stores, there's usually like little knitting kits that have lots of little bits and pieces. And I think that's where I, I have some stoppers in a drawer here. And I think that's probably where they came from. So definitely something to try. Cool tip. And then we have uh, a couple comments about knitting two socks at a time. Powder knits two at a time so you don't have second sock syndrome. And then Llama Loop Joe, I knit them both at the same time, no second sock syndrome. So that's definitely a good tip. If, if you fall into that category where you knit the first one and you don't want to knit the second one, this could be a good way to overcome that. So of course you can knit them two at a time. There's lots of different ways to do it. I've done it, um, of course, two at a time on Magic Loop. You could also do two at a time on um, two circulars, which that's the tutorial we're doing this month. And I really liked that method. I was, I never wanted to do it because I never had two of the same size needle. I don't have a lot of duplicate sock needles, but I had, I had a 32 inch that I had used for like one sock for Magic Loop. And then I had bought a 40 inch length. So I, I had that for two socks for Magic Loop. So I do, I had two circulars of the same size finally. So I, so I figured let's do a tutorial for that. And I really like that method. I don't know why, because it's still, the setup is very similar to Magic Loop, except you're using the two circular needles instead of just one long one. But it feels, I don't know, it's, it feels easier or smoother to move from one side of the sock to the other. You would think it wouldn't because you've got all these extra needles flopping around. And I had long cords. I would not recommend like 40 inch cords for two circulars but I didn't want to invest in more sets of circular needles. But now that I have done the two circular method, I might get like two 24 inch lengths just for that. And I wonder if I could do two socks at the same time on 24 inch lengths. I think I could, but you can do two at a time on magic loop. You could do that on two circulars as well. I want to give that one a try. I've done two at a time on magic loop, but I actually think I prefer knitting with two circulars over that, which it's going to be difficult later on because sometimes I do like s sleeves on Magic Loop and I don't have two of all the different needle sizes. So I have to see about that. But I, for some reason, it just felt not so fiddly. And I'm, I was surprised. I really thought that it would be more fiddly than Magic Loop. But the act of with Magic Loop of you've knit one side, you've got to turn it and you've got to like readjust all your stitches. You have to do that with the two circulars too, but for some reason it was just a much more smooth process. I don't know why. But if you don't like those methods and you like the standard double pointed needles, you can also do two at a time that way. Um, when I first knit probably my second pair of socks, I think I was scared of them not being the same size, like the same length or something. And I wasn't really good at counting my stitches at that point. So what I did was I did the cuff with one set of double pointed needles. And then I cast on and did the, the second sock cuff right away. And then I started the leg and I made sure I really kept track of my rounds on the leg. And then I stopped the leg and did the leg on the other sock. So I did have to have do two sets of double pointed needles for that as well. So there's lots of ways to do two at a time socks. You can even do a sock inside a sock using double knitting, which is another thing I want to give I want to try. It's not as common, I guess. I mean, people do it, but you don't hear about it. When you hear of two socks at a time, you always think magic loop, but there are other ways to do it as well. Our final comment falls under the heading of what I would call knitting confidence. And Sally Ann says this, learning and trusting myself to read my knitting has helped me enormously. It's not an overnight thing, but just being able to glance at a pattern and understand what the next row is rather than worry over every stitch is enlightening. And I just, I love that comment. Thank you so much for sharing that. Everybody, thank you for sharing your comments. There were some fabulous tips in here. And I really love this one too, because you can spend your whole life knitting and perhaps you never knit anything but garter stitch dishcloths or scarves or very simple projects. And you never take time to look at your knitting. There's nothing wrong with that. A lot of people use knitting just as, you know, a relaxing thing to do in the evening. They don't want to look at it and pay attention to it. It's just something for their hands to do. Totally fine. But then there's the category of people who want to 
I don't know, make different things for different reasons. They want the item or they want to really understand how knitting works. I fall in that category. Both of them. I, sometimes I want the knitted thing. Sometimes I just want to know how something works. And this is when you have to take some time. You can't depend on a pattern to like hold your hand for every little thing. It's time to like jump out and really start to understand your craft. You don't have to if you don't want to. That's the beauty of knitting. You can you can knit your garter stitch scarves and dishcloths if you want. It's absolutely fine. But if you want to learn to read your knitting, then you have to look at it. <laughs> I know that sounds really basic, but if you don't actually stop and look at how this yarn loops around your needle, which leg is in the front, which leg is in the back? How do you enter that stitch? How do you exit? How do you wrap your yarn? What are you what are all those movements doing and creating? That's the basic foundation of really reading your knitting. And then of course you can start to fix mistakes because you can read your knitting and it's a whole rabbit hole, I tell you. Like just now I'm into the garments and how the different ways to construct them and there's just so much to explore with knitting. There's just it's I'm I can say I am I'm I am like a certified master hand knitter, but that doesn't mean I know everything. There are so many topics that are not covered. It would take years and years to just explore them all. But I mean, you get you get a good foundation in the basics with that course and really understanding your knitting and a good understanding of how to how to research if you anything that you want to explore outside of what's covered in that I would say that's definitely what I learned the most from that course but yes like you don't have to take that course to like Sally says learn to read your knitting but like she says it's not an overnight thing it takes work and as you knit you just take time to look at it and understand what's happening and understand why certain things go certain ways or you work an SSK one way and a knit two together and why you do that like there's so much to explore but I love that comment and that really does wrap up what we had to chat about today and I'm sure there are plenty of other tips that we could share we could talk about and if you have any I would love to hear them so please leave a comment sharing your sock knitting tips and if you want to read those tips be sure to go down check them out because everybody shares such fabulous advice like the advice that was in this episode and I learned so many great things from other knitters and I do love this community for the most part we have our time sometimes but this is really a fabulous community and if you have advice please share it with us and if you want to keep chatting then I'm going to put a playlist here of some of our other knit and chat episodes all about socks like sock care or sock fit there's a lot to say about that how that little tube should fit on your foot so if you want to just keep knitting and chatting with me then click right there and I'll see you in the next video